Hi, everybody. Uh, this is session four in our advanced technical writing class. Uh, the subject of this class is translation and technical writing. As usual, we start off with what we will copy this week and a reminder for what to read next week. So this week, uh, we will be talking about translation. Uh, we'll be talking about why should technical writers really care about the uh, emerging trends in translation. Uh, then we'll talk about some of those specific emerging trends. We'll talk about XLIF uh, for XML localization interchange, the XML localization interchange file format. We'll talk about translation memory and translation memory exchange. Uh, we'll talk about uh, term base and term base exchange. Uh, but mostly what we'll be talking about is why we really need to care about these uh, very important translation standards and how important translation is in the world of technical writing. So in order to do that, uh, I'm going to uh, begin with uh, something of uh, a history of technical writing, technical communication, or in general, communication and the tools that got us here uh, that we use in technical communication uh, and um, uh, what the world, uh, why, why uh, smart technical writers know that uh, uh, translation is, is ever so important. So uh, as I usually say, unless I make an egregious mistake, uh, if I fumble, I'm just going to keep going here uh, as I usually do. Um, so let's see how that works. So this is an advanced technical writing class. And in an advanced technical writing class, we have empathy for our um, customers. Uh, you could call them customers. If you're uh, writing for websites, you could call them visitors. If, you could, if you're writing for um, uh, different uh, uh, audiences, you could call them different things. But basically, our customers, the people who consume the technical writing uh, that technical writers create. Um, more and more, uh, this is becoming a global audience. So let's look at some terms and uh, uh, talk about how they relate to technical writing. So global, of relating to or involving the whole world. As Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. And of course, uh, I became familiar with this phrase as a teenager when one of my favorite bands at the time, Rush, uh, incorporated this phrase into one of their songs. Uh, all the world's indeed a stage, we are merely players, performers and portrayers each other's audience outside the gilded cage. Uh, so I'm going to talk about several realities. Let's start off with the global reality. It is nearly impossible to do business in this day and age in just one language. Um, so we're talking about communications. It wasn't always that way, but it is that way now. And let's take a look at the evolution of communication. Uh, the first humans used uh, fire, smoke, drums, petroglyphs, pictograms, ideograms, and writing. Uh, and then uh, we evolved to mail, uh, pigeon post, maritime flags. Uh, by the 1300s, wooden blocks uh, of movable type printing were developed in China. By the 1400s, Gutenberg created the printing press with uh, metal movable type. And by the 1600s, uh, the first experimental acoustic mechanical telephone came into being. By seven, in the 1700s, um, phone lines and optical telegraph lines uh, came into being. By the 1800s, we had the electric, electrical telegraph, uh, transatlantic telegraph cable, uh, telephone, and radio. Uh, by the early 1900s, television came around. Uh, transatlantic, transatlantic telephone cables came into being. By the mid and mid-late 1900s, commercial telecommunication satellites, fiber optic telecommunications, computer networking, cellular phone networking, um, and uh, the early uh, stages of email. And then by the late 1900s, we had the internet, uh, mobile satellite, handheld phones. And in the 2000s, we have uh, voice over internet um, uh, telephone. We have uh, smartphones, social media, big data, uh, Google Glass, the internet of things, and on and on and on. Um, along with the evolution of communication came the evolution of tools. In the beginning, uh, there was cave paint and then hammers and chisels. Uh, paper and ink, printing presses, typewriters, computers and printers, world processors and data, word processors and databases. Then came desktop publishing and content management systems. 
So where are we in the tool continuum? Desktop publishing tool-centric communication is still ubiquitous. However, it is giving way rapidly to content management systems, open standard-driven communication. So uh, what does that mean? Well, so now we've looked at global, the global reality. Let's look at the communication reality. Communication, whether it be websites, email campaigns, manuals, brochures, data sheets, marketing, safety bulletins, etc., must be robust in this day and age. The machinery that creates these communications is elegant but complex, powerful but complicated. Uh, so we've looked at the global reality and the communication reality. What about the translation reality? Today's elegant but complex, powerful but complicated tools are sadly seldom optimized for translation. Uh, translation is tricky, it's error prone, and it's full of challenges. It can be expensive, uh, translations are often inaccurate, translations can be inconsistent, and translations can take a long time. Um, you can see some examples here. I don't think I would like to eat off of that kid's menu if they're really serving deep fried baby. Uh, and I think that it's very uh, unfortunate that this uh, Chinese um, um, modeling club, if that's what it really is, uh, thought that the English translation for whatever their uh, Chinese uh, source uh, um, sentence uh, was translated, but nobody was there to troubleshoot and to actually read the English which actually just said that uh, the translation uh, connection failed. And there it is uh, posted uh, somewhere in China. So that's, um, we see various versions of this um, uh, happening uh, quite a bit. So translation is tricky. So the global reality restated, it is nearly impossible to do business in this day and age in just one language. Um, so this session is about filling the gap. Um, let's talk about that. The communication reality tools are elegant but complex, powerful but complicated. Together with the translation reality, tools are seldom optimized for translation. Along with the ultimate global reality, it is nearly impossible to do business in this age with just in just one language. Uh, creates uh, points to a gap. So she or he who can fill this gap will enable accurate, complete, timely information globally without breaking the bank. So how do we fill this gap? Well. Um, the, this session will be all about that. There are, uh, you know, of course, people have been filling that gap for, for years, uh, sometimes efficiently, sometimes inefficiently. Let's talk about the efficient way to do it. The efficient way to do it is to leverage localization, translation, open standards. Uh, so in this class, we'll learn each of those open standards. Uh, we'll apply the open standard uh, with the translation workflow and learn how tools implement those open standards. Okay, so. In a previous class, I've talked about this, and I'll talk about it again. And uh, I even saw some evidence that uh, people are still not quite uh, sure about the difference between an open standard and open source. Uh, that's OK. A lot of people confuse those two things. Uh, so an open standard is a specific instruction for achieving something that is independent of manufacturers or vendors and is available in the public domain, generally without charge. An open standard often uh, provides a standardized way to code a solution for a task. So that's the open standard. Open source is software. It's not the standard, but it's the software. Software whose source code is made available for use, use or modification as users or other developers see fit. It's usually in the public, uh, developed as, as a public collaboration and made freely available. So if let's think about some examples. Open standards might be XML, HTML, DITA, um, USB, uh, some of these other things. Whereas open source might be software like Drupal that we're using in our class or um, uh, some other open source software. There's OpenOffice, for example, which is an alternative to um, Microsoft Office. Um, it's open source. The DITA open, open Toolkit is another one that comes to mind, is open source. And in fact, I have some open source software that I've written and made a public, made available to the public, which I may or may not mention uh, through the course of this, uh, this class. So open standards are not software, they're not tools, they're not proprietary, and they're not de facto. They are solution speci specifications for creating the software tools that solve a common need. Some well-known open standards, I guess I just said this a few minutes ago, or a few seconds ago, HTML, XML, DITA, USB. 
So the open standards that we'll learn about in this session are, of course, XML, which we've already begun to, to learn about. We learned about XML uh, uh, because we, we noticed or we pointed out that it's uh, the underlying open standard for the tools that technical writers use, right? Uh, DITA is an XML vocabulary. We talked about that in class recently. Um, HTML is an open standard. Uh, that's what technical writers who develop uh, content for websites use. And uh, <coughs> XML itself is an open standard. Uh, so let's talk about localization and translation open standards. And the three that we'll focus mostly on in this class are XLIF, TMX, and TBX, all of which are XML vocabularies. So maybe now it's starting to make a little bit of sense why in an advanced technical writing class we spent so much time making sure that the students understood XML, the underlying open standard, for these other dialects, uh, uh, these specialized open standards um, that will become very important for technical writers to know. So oftentimes uh, somebody begins to talk about these things and they use all of the jargon and all of the terms and all of the acronyms um, and it becomes uh, very uh, confusing. Uh, so uh, this is a picture of me giving a, um, a presentation in Wiesbaden, Germany. Uh, and you can see that uh, without the help of knowing some of these terms, it can be just kind of silly. Uh, so let's start off with some translation terms. These are some terms that I will probably use throughout the course of this session. Localization Service Provider, LSP. That's a company providing translation and localization services. SRX, Segmentation Rules Exchange. Uh, this has to do with how we segment the, the blocks of text that we uh, get translated. It's important that uh, segmentation is done in a rational way uh, so that we're not just uh, overpaying for uh, reused uh, translations. Uh, that'll make sense when I talk about translation memory in a little bit here. TBX, term-based exchange, that's an XML open standard representing an, the exchange of termal, terminological data. Uh, TM, translation memory, is a collection of segments which can be sentences, paragraphs, text strings that have been previously translated in order to aid human translators. So the idea there is that every time we make a translation, um, you know, if we know that the, the word for uh, dog, in uh, we've translated it once, by a human being into German and the translation is Hund, then we have a, a pair. We know that dog and Hund are English and German pairs uh, representing the same word. Uh, TMX, Translation Memory Exchange, is the XML open standard define, defining the exchange of translation memory between computer-aided translation and localization tools like XLIF. Um, so TM is the practice of collecting these these pairs. TMX is the open standard by which these pairs are exchanged in uh, the translation workflow. XLIF, uh, this is a very important one, XML localization interchange file format. It's an XML open standard defining lossless interchange and format for translating text. Um, I've mentioned before that I am the chair of the OASIS XLIF technical committee. Uh, so this is one that I am pretty familiar with. Uh, I've written a book on, on XLIF um, uh, that uh, I sometimes use for some of these classes, but I didn't use for this class. So this is one that I will spend a lot of time. It's an important one. XLIF is actually the payload um, when we talk about how do I get what I want translated to my translator and then back into the format. Uh, we do that via XLIF. And then XML we've talked about before. There's also this notion of GILT. Uh, GILT is an acronym, uh, Globalization, Internationalization, Localization, and Translation. This is an industry, uh, the GILT industry. Uh, localization providers are uh, belong to the, uh, this industry. Uh, basically, it makes a distinction between some of the things that we think about in the uh, practice of making one thing available to another group of people in another language. Uh, globalization is making a product or a company worldwide. Uh, internationalization is creating a product that can be marketed worldwide. An example being uh, uh, being able to change a product's language without redesigning the product. Localization is uh, adapting the product 
to the linguistic and cultural norms of a region. And then uh, translation is reproducing the text from the source language into the target language. So uh, throughout this session, I will be using these challenges. I'll talk about uh, different challenges that technical writers have uh, when they face this uh, tricky challenge, this tricky need to translate uh, the content that they create. So challenge number one is the file transfer challenge. And I'll um, kind of uh, uh, do these um, challenges in the form of, of uh, somebody, uh, the uninitiated, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, uh, asking these questions of somebody who has been around the uh, field for a while. So. Do we send the native source files directly to the translators or the localization service provider? And the answer is only if you want it to cost top dollar and take a long time and have errors. Uh, converting the content to XLIF is the solution for this challenge. So let's take a look at XLIF. XLIF is the XML localization interchange format file format. It's an OASIS open standard. Uh, it's available there at the OASIS website at that URL on the screen. Uh, translation tools use XLIF as their native file format. So if you can imagine uh, Microsoft Word, for example, as a word processor, it uses uh, a file name .doc. The .doc is its native format. Um, or X Excel uses .xls. In uh, translation tools, the, uh, the file format that the computer-aided translation tools use, that the translators use to translate uh, the uh, files is XLIF. Uh, translators know and like XLIF. The XLIF 1.2 specification was passed in February of 2008. It had a specification and a schema. Remember we talked about uh, the schema is kind of like a, the DTD. It's the, the rules by which the XML must be formatted. Uh, XLIF 2.0 specification passed on uh, August of 2014 again with a specification and an XML schema. So the specification tells you in human language uh, how to use the um, uh, XLIF and then the XML schema prescribes how the XML must be uh, uh, formatted. So why do we care? Uh, as I said, translation tools open XLIF as a native file format. So uh, there's no file conversion overhead if you give uh, translator an XML file, they will not charge you for uh, transforming the uh, native file format into XLIF, which they need to use their tools. Uh, so there's no, um, also, uh, there's no overhead for translators to buy or learn proprietary software. And that we'll talk about a little bit later. You might say, well, why don't I just give the translator my Microsoft uh, uh, Excel file and just have them translate it? Or, or why don't I give my translators the uh, InDesign file, uh, the desktop publishing InDesign file, and just let them translate it. Well, you could do that, and they would gladly take your money, but in order to do that, they would need to buy and learn how to use uh, InDesign, which is not cheap and not easy. Uh, some formats are ex exceedingly difficult to translate in their native file format. Websites, software, graphics, for example, are quite uh, difficult. However, if you could find a way to transform the content you want translated into XLIF from your website or from your software or from your graphics, you would have a huge advantage. So that's uh, a recommended best practice. So let's introduce XLIF. Uh, as we know, the need to provide information to people who speak different languages is an age-old challenge. Uh, the evolution of the translation process over the years looks something like this. In the beginning, translations were done by brute force. You would just find a way to uh, translate your content. Over time, successful methods became repeatable, processes that could be documented, shared from one group to another. As this momentum grew, these processes became ad hoc standards. You know, for example, I might say um, an ad hoc standard would be for me to gather up all of the uh, words and phrases that I need to have translated, put them in Excel in uh, row A, or excuse me, column A, and then hand the Excel spreadsheet to my translator and have them translate in uh, column uh, B, or the next column. That would be an ad hoc st standard, but it's not uh, um, uh, maintainable. I mean, th there's, there's margin for error, room for error in that kind of an ad hoc process. 
Uh, so the game changer, the watershed moment, occurred when we recognized that ad hoc standards must evolve into open standards, which are predictable and have uh, global universal syntax so that there is no, you know, it's enforced by a standard, by an XML um, a schema or DTD. Therefore, there's no ambiguity and we know exactly what to expect in these file formats because it's a little bit more complex than just this word for this word. And we'll see some of that complexity uh, in some of the later slides. So the impact of XLIF, uh, once XLIF and its fellow translation standards became open standards, tools, translators, content management systems, and translation customers could exchange translation workflows in a predictable way. See, that's very important there, the predictable way. You know, because if, if one uh, uh, translation consumer uh, trains one localization service provider to translate uh, uh, in an um, ad hoc way, uh, that works out fine until um, you know you need to change uh, localization service providers, for example. Okay, so as other XML-based open standards arrived, such as DITA, SVG, and DocBook, and HTML, it became possible to automate the translation workflows using standard tools. And that's what we're going to look at. So let's look at this thing called the XLIF round trip. So that's basically, how do I take my complex format, we'll say a website, how do I take my website and uh, transform it into XLIF, have it translated, and then transform it back into a website? Okay, so there are four steps in this workflow. Uh, step one, a source file in a source language, uh, for example, Microsoft Word file in English. Uh, step two is you transform the source file from in this case, Microsoft Word into XLIF. Then you hand the XLIF to the localization service provider. They translate the XLIF into a target language. Let's say that our source language was, Ger uh, was English and our target language was German. So now uh, the uh, XLIF is translated back into German. And then we transform the XLIF back into its source f uh, format. I know that the words on the screen are different than the words I'm saying, but I think the example that I've been verbally saying is that now we have uh, XLIF converted back into Microsoft Word, and I think I said we were, uh, now it's German. The slide says Chinese, but you get the idea. So the XLIF translation model uh, supports the extract and merge paradigm, which is an established model for efficient translation. So if you look over here on the left-hand side, you start off with your source uh, document. In this case, we'll say it's a website. You extract the localizable or translatable text and format information into a single XLIF file. Uh, you hand that to your localization service provider. They open the tool with, uh, they open the XLIF file with a translation tool uh, that they like to use uh, so that they can leverage translation memory, consult glossaries, deal with segmentation, etc., and actually have the human beings do the translation. So the human beings do the translation, they translate the text, they save that file, and then the file is saved in their uh, computer-aided translation tool as an XLIF file, but now it's bilingual. In this case, it's got the German and the English in one file. We convert that XLIF back into its original format, in this case we said to a website, and now we have a German website that is a, a carbon copy of the uh, English website, only it's translated into German. So XLIF is pretty darn simple at its core and pretty darn smart and pretty darn effective. So we isolate the translatable text into translation units. These units have a source element and they have a target element. The translator goes in and translates the target string into the language of the target translation. We retain the source document's structure either internally or externally. So here's an example. Let's say uh, and I'm purposely using um, uh, file formats that are recognizable uh, and uh, not necessarily content management system. Uh, but this is a, a desktop publishing uh, software called InDesign. Remember I said that in the current continuum, uh, uh, desktop publishing files are ubiquitous, but they are giving way to um, content management systems. But for the ease of uh, illustrating the XLIF workflow, let's just start off with uh, this InDesign file. So this is an InDesign file and it's all about uh, my guitars. Uh, and I think everything on that screen there is true. Um, 
So it's just a simple desktop publishing file with some simple words. Uh, it can, you know, your jobs will get much more complex than this, but I'm just using this to illustrate. So this is our source. And our goal is to translate this into German. So we start off with our InDesign format. Every desktop publisher, almost every tool, uh, has XML at its, uh, at its uh, core and offers usually through the API uh, a way to uh, get at that XLIF, excuse me, to get at that XML. So here is the uh, InDesign format using the graphical user interface, but if we export the XML, this is the uh, uh, XML that's just in a vanilla XML. Uh, its root element is my doc. We have heading one, we have paragraph, we have terms, uh, we have a list, we have list items. Uh, these can be rendered in um, InDesign, uh, but by exposing the XML, we can then uh, begin to do the transformation. So we could hand this XML to our localization service provider, but that's not the most efficient way to do it. The most efficient way to do it is to transform this XML using XSLT or a commercial tool or um, uh, any kind of a tool uh, to transform from this format into XLIF. This is XLIF. This isn't the whole XLIF file. This is just the top of the XLIF file. But you can see that some of the phrases that were in here, Brian's guitars, a guitar is a musical instrument, it has strings, are uh, shown here, Brian's guitar is a guitar is a musical instrument, it has strings uh, in the uh, native XML format. And then we've transformed that into XLIF, into segments with source and target. Uh, Brian's guitars, uh, guitars, a guitar is the musical instrument, it has uh, pick and strings, uh, uh, etc. So um, you can see that now this is a format that the translators can actually use their tools, their computer-aided translation tools, to open natively. So I'm going to show you an example of that. What I'm going to show you is an actually um, a computer-aided translation tool that you could do a translation with that translators would use. This is actually an open source tool that I wrote uh, in Java. Uh, so it goes something like this. You would open the XLIF file in this tool and then you would click the translate button and each of these segments that we saw earlier comes up and gives the uh, translator the opportunity to translate. So we see that this one has Brian's guitars. The translator would translate that into German and then move on to the next segment, next segment, next segment until the whole file was translated. Once the whole file is translated, you see that we have now uh, the source is in English and the target is in German. Uh, source target, source, target, source, target, including some inline elements where we've identified these as terms. And that'll be important uh, as we uh, go get a little bit further into the other uh, uh, translation open standards. So now we have this XLIF file that's been translated. It's a, uh, a translated bilingual XLIF file. So we transform the XLIF back into the InDesign XML format. But now uh, it's all of the same elements, all of the same attributes, but now uh, the text is in German. So now if we import that or open it in InDesign, I have a lossless exchange where I've gone from English to German. And I didn't have to hand the InDesign files to my localization service provider because they would have either charged me to do the transformation themselves, which is a lot of expensive overhead, or they would have had to buy InDesign and learn how to use InDesign, which by the way is expensive and not easy, and they would have done the translation right in InDesign. They may have made some mistakes with some elements, or they may have uh, not had a one-to-one -one exact uh, exchange. A lot of things could have gone wrong, and for sure it would have been expensive. But this way, we did um, we did the uh, uh, transformation in a lossless way, where we've um, mitigated a lot of the expense, room for error, and uh, and time. So I'm going to go through some of these what I call reasonable questions to ask by the uninitiated. And by uninitiated, I don't mean that as a derogatory term. I just mean somebody who hasn't 
uh, been down this road. So you may ask, uh, why not just hand the translator the InDesign files to translate? Okay, we kind of answered that. I just kind of answered that a minute ago. And then you might say, okay, but then why not just hand the translator the XML file? And I just kind of explained that, right? If they had to learn how to translate every flavor of XML, you know, we just looked at InDesign. There's a different flavor for Word, a different flavor for um, some of the graphic formats, a different flavor for a lot of the other uh, formats. Those are generally proprietary formats, uh, so um, that would be kind of expensive. So, you know, the, the reasonable person might say, okay, I get that. But I kind of get uh, that with simple documents. Uh, but what about complex things like like websites, software, graphics, and videos. Uh, so uh, why not just hand the translator the InDesign file? Uh, translator's uh, expertise is in translating, not operating various software required to process different formats. Processing a uh, proprietary format requires them to purchase and learn a variety of software packages. They will charge you for that. The other answer is that XLIF is a native file format uh, that the localization service providers computer-aided translation tools, CAT tools, open and process. No processing fee, no overhead. Okay, then why not just hand the translator the XLIF to translate? And I see that I'm actually answering these uh, slides, uh, and I, I sort of answered them before. So again, I wouldn't consider this an egregious mistake. I'm just going to continue on. But you get the kind of cadence here, right? I'm answering all of those questions. Uh, the answer is they would still need to learn a variety of XML flavors. Uh, XML editing tools are expensive with a steep learning curve, um, and XLIF is a native file format for their CAT tools, uh, no processing or fees or overhead. Okay, so how do people transform the file into and out of XLIF? Uh, the answer is some tools have an export to XLIF option, uh, like Visual Studio, Drupal, uh, Oxygen, um, but nearly all the tools can export to XML. Uh, that XML can be round trip transformed using open source utilities like the Dita XLIF round trip plugin or the XLIF round trip tool. Again, these are two open source uh, utilities that I wrote and that I made available for free uh, to the public. Um, and you can get those at those URLs. Uh, okay, I kind of get it with simple documents like that, but what about complex things like websites, software, graphic videos? Uh, as th the answer is, as the complexity increases, so do the technical challenges. Uh, most of the complex things can be exported and imported into an XML format. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we teach classes like this. Okay, so that's XLIF, and hopefully that's beginning to make sense to you. It's the file format. It's the, the payload. But there are other cha challenges along, along the way, not just how do I get the, the content to a localization service provider, but then how can I kind of save money and, and uh, do some other goodness along the way. And then the second challenge will be translation memory. Uh, so um, so the, the person would say, okay, this thing I'm sending contains several segments that I've already translated in the past. Isn't there a way to leverage the already translated segments? The answer is yes, as long as you and your localization service provider have been saving your translation pairs in the form of TMX files. Um, and then the, the person might say, but wait, can't I just store them in a spreadsheet? And the answer is uh, using an open standard lets you transform uh, transfer the translation memory from vendor to vendor and is directly accessible in CAT tools, which a spreadsheet would not necessarily be. There would be some training. That the spreadsheet would be an ad hoc method, and the TMX file would be a method supported by open standards. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about TMX. So this is translation memory and TMX. So TMX is translation memory exchange. It's an open standard for exchanging translation memory. It's available at that URL. Uh, translation tools use TMX to leverage and add to translation memory. Uh, the latest version, 1.4b, was passed in uh, April 2005. It has a specification and a DTD. Uh, translation memory, on the other hand, uh, is not the same as translation memory exchange. Translation memory is not an open standard, but rather a practice. It enables the translation of segments, sentences, paragraphs, or phrases of documents by searching for similar segments in a collection and, uh, and suggesting matches that are found. Okay. Um, so here's an example. Let's say that we start off with a DITA file. You, you remember this is, uh, we looked at DITA before, there can be hundreds or thousands of topics within uh, one project, uh, but we'll say that this is a, a DITA uh, concept it's got two paragraphs, one about nirvana, 
and one about the clash, actually three paragraphs, and one about Soundgarden. Um, so what we would do is we would uh, use one of those utilities that I mentioned before, and we would uh, transform all of those data topics into um, uh, a single XLIF file. And then we would give that XLIF file to our localization service provider, and they would open it in their computer-aided translation tool. So now we see that we have the, the sentence about Nirvana, the sentence about The Clash, uh, and Soundgarden, and some Ramones, and MC5, uh, some other things. Uh, so once they open that, they would uh, see that they have their XLIF, and sure enough, this is valid, good XLIF. We see that XLIF is the root element. This is part of the file with those three sentences that I talked about. They would need in their uh, computer-aided translation file to set the translation memory file, so they would click that button and they would choose the translation memory exchange file. And in this case, we see that they've chosen um, a translation memory exchange file. And I'll give you that. This is the view in the tool. This is a view of uh, uh, a bit of that uh, XML. And you can see that this isn't XLIF. This is TMX. And the purpose of this format, this open standard, is over time as I pay for translations. I want to save those translations, to have a memory of those translations. In case I'm ever required to, sent to translate that sentence or that segment again, I can just turn to my translation memory, which I know has been approved in previous translations, and make this a candidate for the translation that uh, uh, I want to use. In other words, not pay for it over and over, uh, but rather draw it from a, a memory bank. So we see that this has those three uh, sentences that have been translated in the past. And we just saved them in a translation memory file, TMX file. And we've presented that to our computer-aided translation tool. It looks for all of the XLIF segments and sees if there are any XLIF segments. And then uh, it creates translation candidates out of those. So the way that works is now we're back in our XLIF we can see that down here is the segment uh, about Nirvana. And it grabbed that uh, English segment from the translation memory exchange file, and it put them in this matches element. And it said that here's a candidate for translation. You've already paid for this once. I have this string that came out of my translation memory meta, uh, database. In the past, you translated it into this sentence in German. And I will give you that as an option uh, to, to uh, translate uh, going forward. So in the computer-aided translation tool, we note that in the past, this sentence was translated this way. And if we uh, choose it, we will say, OK, that's a good match. I'll accept that. And I won't charge you, customer, for translating the string. I will simply uh, charge you uh, much less by uh, using it as a 100% exact match. Uh, so then you go through your whole file, you find all of your matches, and if you choose to accept them, you can. Uh, and then in this case, we've had this XLIF file translated into German uh, by uh, just leveraging uh, translations that have been previously done. Okay, So then we convert them back into, uh, in this case, DITA, and now we have a DITA topic. OK, so that was the translation memory challenge. Here's the third challenge. What about a translation glossary? In my industry, there are a lot of terms that could be ambiguous to translators who are not necessarily experts in our field. Also, we want to make sure that some terms are always translated correctly consistently with my company style guide. Can I send a glossary of terms to the translators to keep all of this straight? The answer is yes, but you should store your glossary in TBX files. Uh, tools can read these directly, and TBX defines a standardized way to store the useful metadata about the terms. And again, since it's an open standard, you can pass it from vendor to vendor, and they will understand it. So let's look at TBX. TBX is term-based exchange. It's available at that uh, URL there. Translators use TBX to understand and disambiguate terms. Translators know and like TBS, TBX. Uh, 1.0 specification was passed in 2008 with a specification and a DTD. So let's look at term base and TBX. So remember, I had this XLIF file, and XLIF allows you to mark things up as terms. So we know that this word here, concert, is a term. XLIF has identified that. 
So the computer-aided uh, translation tool then will let you uh, select a TBX file. And this is our whole library of terms that we've collected that are important to us in our, disc in our um, industry. So we know that a term could be ambiguous, right? Or excuse me, concert could be, you know, you could say I'm going to a, my favorite band's concert, or you could say I'm going to do this in concert with uh, some other things that I'm going to do. Um, so this disambiguates it. Uh, it says that this is the term, and this term's definition is a live performance typically of music before an audience. Uh, and then optionally, if I have the translation laying around, I can put it here, but that's not the primary use of TM TBX. The primary use is to say that this is my term, this is its definition, so it's not ambiguous. So then uh, I can look at um, uh, my TBX file. This happens to uh, be a, just a, 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 a one term out of many in this TBX file. I have a description type. I have a description definition. I have a term and an optional translation. Um, uh, we process the, uh, the XLIF to show this so that then in the XLIF file we have this thing called glossary and we know that uh, concert is translated this way and its definition is this. That helps the translator to not pick the wrong term uh, to put into, uh, to not uh, translate um, incorrectly. So again, here's that same thing. We have our unit, uh, we have our glossary here that helps the translator that when they come, when it comes time to translate this sentence, they'll know that concert is defined as a live performance, typically of music before an audience. So that's not terribly ambiguous, but let's look at some more ambiguous examples. Uh, let's say that we're talking about our guitar, um, our guitar uh, uh, document and uh, the word pick. Well, a guitar pick is one thing, but pick uh, um, can mean a lot of different things. You know, you can, there's a pick in basketball. Uh, you could pick Andrew Luck as your first round draft pick in the NFL draft in 2012. Uh, you could pick an apple. Uh, there's a pick, uh, a pickaxe, that, uh, and there's a, a pick that's a dental, dental instrument, and people can pick your pocket. Uh, but if we disambiguate this term uh, with TBX, uh, the translator says, ah, pick. It's defined as a small, thin device, metal or plastic, used to pluck a stringed instrument. Ah, so the translator knows exactly uh, what term we're talking about. It's disambiguated. Okay, so that's how we use the open standards. How do we use those open standards with the specific open standards that we've talked about in this class? How do we use those things, XLIF, TMX, and TBX, for example, to translate DITA? Uh, so remember, DITA is Darwin Information Typing Architecture. It's a vocabulary for topic-based authoring, archiving, and published. And remember, uh, this is all review because we talked about this in the last class. DITA project consists of several topics and maps. Uh, the DITA topic is the basic unit of DITA content. Uh, the topic's scope is a single subject. The topic is short enough to be specific to a single subject or to answer, answer a single question, but long enough to make sense on its own and to be authored as a standalone unit. So that's our challenge with DITA. Uh, DITA maps are mechanisms used uh, to enable topics to be organized for creating outputs. Maps uh, enable order and hierarchy of a set of topics, and maps can come in two formats, DITA map or book map. So the challenge here is, or the, the strength is, we might have a data sheet that makes use of key analysis features topic and um, uh, key performance specification topics along with others. But the key analysis feature topic is also used in my user manual, and the uh, key performance uh, specification is also used in my online help. So this is just a, 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 um, to, to show you that one topic can be used s several times across many different publications. Um, so this means that translating can be difficult or easy. This, here's the paradox. DITA's strength is its ability to harness many topics for a variety of outputs. DITA's difficulty for localization service provider is that it, there are many, many files to manage. Uh, the strategy is to take advantage of DITA's map file in order to manage the many topic files, create an XSLT to read the map file, and convert each of the referenced files as a single XLIF file for our translator to translate. Uh, I say it's a paradox because it seems pretty straightforward, but um, uh, a lot of times it's just not that easy if you don't do it the right way. 
So some people just skip that XLIF step and they just say, let's just throw all of these topics over the wall to our, uh, to our localization service provider. So, you know, the, the technical writer may say, hey boss, let's switch to DITA and content management system. Great idea, huh? And the boss is like unimpressed. It's nimble. The boss says, well, whatever. Uh, no more document center constraint. And the boss scratches his head saying, what on earth are you talking about? It's supported by uh, tools and best practices, and the boss has become kind of bored by this time. And a more precise information for our customers. Uh, and the boss finally says, just show me the money. And the, the technical writer says, well, we can, I've heard we can save boatloads of money and time uh, on translation. And the boss finally gets excited and supports that. Nine months later, though, they take a look and crunch the numbers, and something went wrong. So what is that something? The problem is that lots and lots of data files are, can be tedious to process one by one, right? So these are uh, an example. In the lower right-hand corner, we have maps that make references to data topics. Um, and uh, projects can consist of hundreds, thousands, or even millions of topics. Localization service providers can process topics one by one, uh, but it's not their core competency. And they will rightly charge extra for all of the overhead and the expertise. So uh, in order to solve this, we can use the DITA XLIF round trip. Um, it starts off with the DITA Open Toolkit. Uh, so we know that the DITA Open Toolkit transforms DITA into uh, PDF, XML, HTML, etc. cetera. Um, nearly every DITA, open t uh, DITA, DITA tool has a version of the DITA Open Toolkit integrated within its framework. Uh, DITA Open Toolkit is an open source and it's run at the command line. And so we went over how that's done in our previous slides. Uh, what you can do is you can augment the DITA Open Toolkit with this plugin that I've created called the DITA XLIF Round Trip plugin for the DITA Open Toolkit. So you go off there and you download it. You put the uh, toolkit, uh, the, the plugin that I've prescribed, into the standard plugins directory in the DITA Open Toolkit. And this will supercharge the DITA Open Toolkit now with the ability to create XLIF files from DITA using the DITA Open Toolkit. Uh, so we start off with this particular DITA project. Uh, it's got a map which refers to images, concepts, and tasks. And here's a snapshot of what one of those pages looks like. Uh, we launch the start command or the start command uh, bat or shell script. And we went over how to do this in our uh, DITA class, uh, or our DITA session in the advanced technical writing class. Uh, we change directories into the XLIF directory. Uh, and then we type this command and the DITA uh, Open Toolkit goes off and it processes this, uh, um, these uh, DITA topics and it creates an XLIF file and it tells you that the build was successful and it tells you where to go find it. So now we go get the XLIF file and we see that it's uh, English English now. Um, we translate the uh, English. In this case, I, I'm doing a pseudo translation where I just prepend the word fake in front of each um, uh, target and that creates this, uh, 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 this bilingual file. I change directories into the DITA from XLIF uh, directory, and I type, a, um, uh, I place all of the uh, files into that directory, and I type the, uh, the command that will uh, build the DITA from XLIF. It's successful, and I change directory into that root directory, and I see that indeed my uh, pseudo translated file exists now. So that's how we use these open standards to translate uh, DITA. Uh, what about websites? So translating websites can be really complex. Uh, translating websites has a unique challenge. Unlike most other content types, websites do not lend themselves to a simple file exchange with translators. You have two choices. You can allow the translators access to your site and have them translate on your server. This is almost never a good idea. Uh, being non-web developers, translators can do much harm to a website. Or you can export the files into an intermediary, intermediary, fi intermediary file format and have these files translated. Then you import the translated files back into your website. This is a best practice. Uh, it's key to create a good workflow that includes XLIF at, as its file interchange format. Uh, so. Why is it that letting translators translate on a server is a bad idea? Uh, the following use case shows how a website in the popular translate management system, excuse me, popular content management system, Drupal, which is the one we use in this class, 
would be translated without using xlib. So if you go to uh, the Drupal translation core module, you see that uh, this is how they say you should do your translation. But I'm telling you that this is not a good idea, and I'm going to show you why. Uh, so using the non xlib way, the translator would actually have to be given uh, permission and access to the website. The translator would log into Drupal, uh, would click the Translate tab, uh, would pick the language they want to translate into, uh, and then they would go through and they would say, OK, I'm going to translate the subtitle. I'm going to translate the details title. I'm confused about what all of these things are, legacy channel code. Uh, but I see this thing called unique name. Uh, so unique name uh, must mean German name. So I'll just translate this. And once they do, boom, they just blew up every node of this content type in the whole database. How do I know? I'd rather not say, <laughs> but it's, it's true. And then, oh, by the way, I accidentally uh, picked uh, Japanese and I've just translated it all into German. So these are real life problems that can happen if you have a translator whose core competency is to translate uh, into a content management system. Uh, they're not web developers. They don't know the content management system, or they would have to go through some real intense training. Uh, so uh, this is generally not a good idea. Uh, the better idea is to use Xlif. Um, the following use case shows how that's done. Uh, so you translate uh, Drupal with Xlif using this uh, Xlif module plugin. Uh, so the fundamentals uh, are that all the Drupal steps are done by a Drupal administrator, and the translator does all of his or her work using their computer-aided translation tools, which is a much better uh, um, workflow. So the way this works, the administrator, the Drupal administrator logs in. They pick the XLIF module. They select what node to translate. In this case, the, uh, the bit error rate test tester. Uh, they export those nodes to XLIF. Uh, they save the file locally. They do some post processing, right? Because they some things they do want to have translated, like one year warranty, and some things like field inventory status, they do not want to have translated. So they, the tool allows you to set the state as final, which will shield that particular segment from being translated. Uh, so the XLIF is sent to the localization service provider. So the content owner has done all of the work in blue there and just left the translator to do the work that's in yellow there uh, in this diagram, which is uh, much more safe and uh, less error prone and uh, less expensive and more accurate. So this is another uh, computer-aided translation tool. The localization service provider has leveraged the translation memory, has abided by the uh, TBX glossary, and has translated uh, the file into German. So now we do have uh, the field that we wanted to have translated, one-year warranty, but we don't have the uh, field inventory status. Uh, we've shielded that from translation. So then we, uh, down this uh, lower part, we've uh, gotten our XLIF file. We import it back into our source uh, format. And we see that now we have a translated website. So this is how uh, we've transformed or translated uh, DITA content management systems and Drupal web content management systems using XLIF, TMX, and TBX. Uh, hopefully uh, this makes sense and everybody agrees that this is uh, the proper way uh, to do our XLIF um, uh, translations. So with that, uh, thank you everybody, and I will conclude the um, the, the uh, video here.